This is weird. Starting a video for my that I'm starting the video is weird. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me for that. I do apologize. Um, so. uh -oh. We got puppies coming through. <laughs> um, we're still running a couple seconds early here, I hope. Um... Okay, we're still running a couple seconds early, I believe, but anyway, um, we're just setting up. My wife, Andrea, is going to be teaching Bible study today, um, so I'd just like to welcome everybody that's joining into the uh, Lord of the Harvest Facebook Live um, livecast, and if you're, if you're new, you know, welcome. Um, from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, we do our, our Bible study from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock, we do our actual message. Um, so we're just sharing everything with you today. And I just want to say thank you for coming. Thank you for joining. Um, this is obviously what the world knows, or the, at least America knows, is Easter Sunday. This is the Resurrection Sunday, the day we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Um, you know, John... 20, 11 through 18 gives an account of that resurrection where Jesus, uh, Mary comes to the tomb and she's looking and she can't find him. She sees angels, you know, and um, she, uh, she, you know, she hears, don't be afraid. And, and you know, he's not here, walks out and, and Jesus confronts her in his new resurrected form, confronts her. She, she, um, mistakes him for a gardener and and he he just says her name in a way that she knows it's him and that's an, this is the most important time in history everything that's going on this is the most important time in history because that's the the moment that hope of everything is revealed to the world that resurrection that moment is where our freedom was sealed when he appeared to people our freedom in him was sealed. So with that, I'm just going to pray. And then my wife, is Andrea, is going to be teaching the Bible study today. So Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for your life, which, which taught us so many things, for your death, which bought us, and for your resurrection, which gives us hope, Lord. Lord, everything that's going on in this, in this hour, Lord, you are God above all. You are on the throne. Lord, we just lay our lives down at your feet and we give this time to give give this time to you, Lord. We praise you for for your life, death, and resurrection. And Lord, we just want to hear the words that you would want us to, to hear today and be people that are changed by your love and people that are free from sin, free from struggle, and people that are renewed. And have a hope as they walk in the midst of this chaos that's going on right now, Lord. Help us to be what you want us to be in this hour. We put our lives in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I want to thank Rob already introduced me. I'm Andrea Elliott from Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. Uh, I know Rob already opened, but I'm just going to open in prayer anyway. Lord, just thank you so much for your resurrection life that gives us life. We are so grateful to you. Lord, I just ask that you would, that my words would glorify you today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> um, we're going to start in Matthew 26, 36, in the um, Garden of Gethsemane. So, and then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What, could you not watch with, with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. <clears throat> And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. I'm going to be pointing out some things that, um, that I noticed when I, I was reading through this passage earlier this week or throughout the week and reading. And um, what I felt like the Lord led me to do was actually compare the Garden of Gethsemane with the Garden of Eden. So that's what we're going to be doing um, I'm not going to read all of the Garden of Eden narrative, but we're going to start in Genesis 2.8, and I'm going to be skipping around and kind of inserting some, just some things that I noticed, that I observed when I was comparing the two accounts. So we're going to start in Genesis 2.8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. Okay, so right there it says that God planted the Garden of Eden in the east. Um, now, in the account of the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was praying um, in Luke's gospel, he places it uh, in the Mount of Olives, or the Mount of Olives area. And Zechariah 14.4 describes the Mount of Olives as being east of Jerusalem. And then again, when, when we go back to the um, Garden of Eden account, when Adam and Eve were ba banished, God placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. So I kind of looked up eastward and moving east, and usually moving east is moving away from the garden or away from God's presence. And that's significant later on in the Gethsemane narrative. So I'll come back to that a little bit. And then in verse 9, we're still in Genesis 2, verse 9. The Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then later on in verse 15, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely die. So we're going to go back to Gethsemane. Gethsemane, the word Gethsemane actually means oil press. And it's probably because there were oil um, olive trees there. <clears throat> so that's just a, a note here. Um, then later in Genesis three seventeen to 19, God tells Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will, eat, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. So originally in the Garden of Eden, God is the one who planted 
you know, who caused the trees to grow. It just the narrative says that he caused the trees and the plants to grow for food. And now, you know, after, later on, this is later after, we're going to kind of skip around, like I said, so I hope this isn't confusing. Um, but later on, after Adam and Eve ate the fruit from the tree that they weren't supposed to eat from, God tells Adam that now you're going to have to work hard for your food. There's kind of an inference there that, yeah, Adam was going to have to work and cultivate the garden originally, but it seems like there was going to be an ease to it. It was going to be a pleasant task. Maybe not pleasant, but fulfilling, I guess. You know, it was, it was, there was going to be an ease to it. God caused, originally caused the trees to grow. Everything was ready for him. And now, after the fall, after Adam and Eve disobey God, now it's going to be difficult. It's going to be toilsome. And the, uh, olive trees, the olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane, they're, it's um, harvesting the olive oil. And you, uh, they ate the olives. The olives were, you know, they would eat them, but mostly they were used for oil. And it was a pretty laborious process. It was, they had to, um, well, they had to press the olives. They had to, they put slabs, like stone slabs on the olives to make the olive oil run into pits and they would collect it in jars and there's some other significance to that and there is a lot of significance to out to olives in the bible but i'm just focusing on this particular part of it right now <clears throat> so this is just a contrast really from what god originally you know how he originally made work for man and how Later, you know, after sin, after disobedience, work was going to be more difficult there. I just think that those trees, the, the fact that Gethsemane is um, called oil press, and it's there are probably olive trees that, and then the trees in the Garden of Eden, there's just kind of a contrast there of what was originally meant to be and what, you know, what man caused to be as far as work. And then in um, Genesis 3 3, now we'll go ahead and go to the uh, eating of the fruit. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. And this has always struck me because God never said you must not touch the tree. He said you must not eat from it. Um, and it just made me wonder, did Eve, you know, did the woman have like some doubt already? Uh, I know I've heard people say, you know, I've heard teachings that Eve kind of got the information, the command, that command, commandment um, secondhand because it was, it was Adam who told her. So, you know, did she already kind of, either not understand or have some doubts or did the serpent which we know in Re from revelation revelation 12 9 we know that the serpent is the devil um revelation 12 9 says so the great dragon was cast out that serpent of old called the devil and satan who deceives the whole world he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him um so thus the you know i'm gonna kind of use serpent and devil interchangeably later <clears throat> but you know we don't know did eve already have a doubt did did the devil plant the doubt in her mind and she just succumbed to temptation we don't really know um but that was that's always been interesting to me that she kind of added on to what god said <clears throat> you will not certainly die the serpent said to the woman for god knows that when you eat from it your eyes will be opened and you will be like god knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So the woman in the Garden of Eden, she allowed her doubt, you know, to tempt her and it, she, she disobeyed God. And then Adam chose to disobey along with her. Um, 
even though they knew there was a threat of death, of not being in eternity, being in the garden eternally with God, they ate, they ate it anyway. So they sacrificed eternal life, eternal life in the Garden of Eden with the presence of God because the t devil told them they would be like God. God had already created them in his image, but that, didn't, that wasn't satisfying enough for them. They listened to what the devil said. They wanted to control their own destiny, destinies, really. And because of that, humankind lost face-to-face -face communion with God. Really, this was the very first pandemic. This, this disobedience of God has caused every pandemic in history. It's caused every epidemic, every illness. It's caused mankind to be separated from God. Um, it resulted in human beings committing atrocities against each other. Like shortly after this, this account of the fall of man in the Bible, we read about Cain killing his brother Abel. You know, shortly after that, we just see all, the, all these horrible things happening that weren't intended to happen. This was not how the Garden of Eden was, the existence was not going to be like this in the Garden of Eden. And, you know, we might think that we control our own destinies. I hear that a lot. You know, um, I'm in charge of my own destiny. But I think COVID-19 has really made it hit home that we can be disrupted. We can be interrupted at any time. You know, we are, we are not in control. Um, the pandemic of sin, and I'm going to call it a pandemic, is rampant still but there's a huge difference between that pandemic and COVID-19 there's a cure um, so let's go back to the Garden of Gethsemane <clears throat> so we see the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus and they're not able to stay awake you know they're kind of like to me they're this this picture of humankind like after the fall, there's just this, this, I just think in this narrative, there's really a comparison between the Garden of Eden and kind of what God intended and what happened after Adam and Eve disobeyed him. And then how it, you know, how it is after that, how it is during that time. <clears throat> uh, Matthew 26, 40. Oh, and so you know, the disciples are not, they're not able to stay awake. They're, they fail, you know, like Adam and Eve. Um, in Matthew 26, 41, Jesus beseeches Peter to watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How often do we let our own desires, um, even, you know, things we think we need. I mean, they were tired. They were legitimately tired. And another account says that they, were, they slept because they were sorrowful. Um, sometimes we just let things overwhelm us. And just like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, now the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, instead of relying on the strength of the Holy Spirit, we let ourselves become complacent. We make excuse, excuses. And I'm not saying that it's, you know, they're, like you can't sleep or anything, you know. I'm just saying we will find ways to listen to what we want, listen to our own desires, instead of really following the Holy Spirit and his leading and what he wants us to do. So when God created the Garden of Eden, there's just, again, this, this contrast. It was, it was going to be a place of life and growth. The plants were going to thrive. The you know, there was going to be plenty of food. Um, humankind lived with animals. You know, they didn't eat animals. The, the Genesis, you know, the Garden of Eden account says they ate plants. So there was wildlife and it just was a thriving atmosphere. <clears throat> In the Garden of Gethsemane is really kind of the beginning of real acute emotional, physical, and spiritual suffering that we, we really can't comprehend it. In Matthew 26, 39, 
Jesus fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Adam and Eve chose to throw away eternal life because they wanted to be like God. Jesus, who was God, embraced a horrific death because he knew that it would bring humankind back into relationship with his father, with God. God's original intention of the Garden of Eden was relationship, relationship with humans, relationship with mankind, relationship with us. Knowing the suffering Jesus was about to endure, he still chose God's will over his own. And this is just such a contrast to the fall, such a contrast to what Adam and Eve chose and what we choose regularly. Luke's depiction of Jesus's prayer in Luke 22, 40 to 44 says, when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed saying, father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then the angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And this is another image of that olive press. Again, or the the oil press, um, which is the meaning of Gethsemane. After the olives were crushed, the olives would be initially crushed, and then heavy stone slabs were lowered down onto them to squeeze out all the oil. It was, it would... And there, it must have been on a slope or something because it would go into pits and then it was collected into jars. And we know Isaiah 53, 5, which is a prophecy um, written long before Jesus' crucifixion, says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed like, that, like those olives for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. But even worse to Jesus than the physical suffering, and I think the location of the of the Garden of Gethsemane being in the east kind of is a foreshadowing, if you will, of of this. Um, Jesus knew that he was going to be separated from his Father for a time, from God for a time, for the first time in eternity. We know that John one one and two says. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with, was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. <clears throat> Jesus knew that on the cross, he, he knew, he already knew that this was going to happen. He, he was going to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't even know if there's a good analogy for us to comprehend the despair and the agony Jesus felt about that separation. I don't know if our finite minds can honestly grasp it. We're, we live here on the earth. We are now finite. And our bodies here, you know, our, the way we think here. Yes, we are, we are eternal, but we're also finite, restricted here on this earth to the way we think and the way we grasp things is, is not eternal like God. <clears throat> and, you know, I, we experience grief when we lose loved ones and probably that's I think the closest we can get to what Jesus felt but it was a lot more than that um because he had this eternal relationship with the father and he knew that that for a brief time that was going to be just ripped apart You know, Jesus, he went through pain. He went through suffering. He did this willingly so that we could be reconciled to the Father, to God. He understands our suffering. He he knows. We're not, we are not alone. Even now with like all this, with the virus, with COVID-19, you know, we're not alone. He's with us. And let's, let's remember that, that he, he understands. So now I'm going to go to a different garden, Um, and this is what we're celebrating today. We're celebrating Resurrection Sunday, like Rob already said, and the Gospel of John actually sets the tomb 
where Jesus was re resurrected in a garden. So I'm going to read that account. It's in John 19, 38 uh, through 2018. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know or understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Women, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now we, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you, had carried, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, her Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. <clears throat> so again, this is, this is set in another garden, and, but this is the setting of the resurrection of life. Jesus defeated death. Jesus paid for our sins with his life, but he rose from the dead. That, that, uh, that pandemic of sin, the cure for that, is Jesus Christ. And when Mary Magdalene, um, it, you know, when she first saw Jesus, the, she thought he was the gardener. But then he said her name, and she woke up. It's like, you know... Earlier in Gethsemane, the disciples were sleeping. They were sorrowful and sleeping. She woke up to his presence. Jesus knows your name. He knows each of us. He knows our names. And he wants us to know him. He wants us to be in relationship with him. Let's remember COVID-19 does not have the final say. We follow a God who suffered and gave us victory over death. We're never alone. We don't have to be alone. He understands pain, loss, grief, suffering. You know, there may not be a cure for COVID-19, but we have hope of eternal life in and with Jesus Christ. So let's continue to seek after him and put our trust in him. That's where our hope lies, is in him. That's it. So well, Rob is, uh, he's going to come and close us out in prayer. Thank you for listening. Pastor Oz and Pastor Jan will be back at 11 o'clock for the Sunday service.
So, thank you, Andrea. That was that was awesome. And I'm not saying that because you're my wife. It really was a very good, very awesome study. Um, as Andrea already said, uh, we're going to take a short break. We're going to be back at 11. Uh, Pastor Oz will be teaching um, from his home. So just pray right now for any technical difficulties that may arise. Pray against them so that way we can make sure that... Uh, Everything goes smoothly there. Uh, we thank everybody that 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 jumped on and listened. Um, you know, the the bottom line is today is a day of of hope. Above everything that's going on, today is a day of hope. It's the day that that we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, which which is the hope for a a, a future, a hope for a life that. Just I, I always struggle for words to explain, but that the 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 life of Jesus teaches us things, the death of Jesus redeems us, and then the resurrection of Jesus gives us hope for the future in Him that all things are possible if we believe in Him above our political stances, if we believe in Him above our idols of whatever they are that it gives us hope that if we believe in him and follow his teaching and love him that there is a future of a better world we're in a world right now where there's a lot of confusion and turmoil but one thing we know is Jesus calls us to love the Lord our God with all our heart mind soul and strength and to love our neighbor as ourself and if we're doing those things under his forgiveness, you know, then there's there's just a new life in that. So with that, Father, we just thank you for this your word, Lord. We thank you for the things that you wanted to share today, Lord, through Andrea. Father, we just ask that you would sow those words into our heart, Lord, that you would help us to look at this day as the resurrection as, as the most important thing in history, Lord, that we would set aside every distraction, Republican, Democrat distraction, the, my wounds distraction, whatever, that we set aside every distraction, Lord, and that we, we just focus on you and loving you for who you are. We give you our lives, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, there's going to be a short break. Um, I think it's like 10.35 or something right now. So there's going to be a short break. Um, Facebook Live, Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship, 11 o'clock. We will be rejoining with Pastor Oz from his home. Thank you.